Appendix G of Principles of Economics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Principles of Economics by Alfred Marshall. Appendix G. Title the incidence of local rates with some suggestions as to policy we have seen note 65 that the incidence of a new local tax on printing would differ from that of a national tax mainly by causing such parts of the local printing industry as could conveniently migrate beyond the boundaries of the local tax to do so those customers who needed their printing to be done in the local in the locality would pay rather higher for it. Compositors would migrate till only enough remained to find employment locally at about the same wages as before, and some printing offices would be transferred to other industries. The incidence of general local rates on immovable property follows different lines in some respects. The power of migration beyond the boundaries of the rates is a very important factor here, as in the case of a local tax on printing. But of perhaps even greater importance is the fact that a large part of the local rates is spent in ways that conduce directly to the comfort of those very residents and workers in the locality who might otherwise be driven away. Here, two technical terms are needed. Onerous rates are those which yield no compensating benefit to the persons who pay them. An extreme case is that of rates devoted to paying interest on a loan incurred by a municipality for an enterprise which failed and has been abandoned. A more representative case is that of a poor rate levied mainly from the well-to-do. Onerous rates tend, of course, to drive away those persons on whom they would fall. On the other hand, Beneficial or remunerative rates are those spent on lighting, draining, and other purposes, so as to supply the people who pay the rates with certain necessaries, comforts, and luxuries of life, which can be provided by the local authority more cheaply than in any other way. Such rates ably and honestly administered, may confer a net benefit on those who pay them, and an increase in them may attract population and industry instead of repelling it. Of course, a rate may be onerous to one class of the population and beneficial to another. A high rate spent on providing good primary and secondary schools may attract artisan residents while repelling the well-to-do. Services which are preponderantly national in character are generally onerous, while those which are preponderantly local in character generally confer upon ratepayers a direct and peculiar benefit more or less commensurate with the burden. Note 66. But the term ratepayer needs to be interpreted differently in regard to different kinds of local expenditure. Rates spent on watering the streets are remunerative to the occupier, but of course those spent on permanent improvements yield only a part of their return to him the greater part accrues in the long run to the landlord. The occupier 
generally regards the rates which are collected from him as forming a single aggregate with his rent. But he makes his reckoning also for the amenities of life, which are secured by remunerative local expenditure of rates. That is, he tends other things equal to select districts in which the aggregate of rents and onerous rates is low. But there is great difficulty in estimating the extent to which migration is actually governed by this consideration. It is probably hindered less than is commonly supposed by ignorance and indifference, but it is much hindered by the special requirements of each individual. Low rates in Devonshire will not draw the people who prefer London life, and certain classes of manufacturers have practically little choice as to the place in which they settle. To say nothing of personal and business ties, the tenant is further hindered by the expense and trouble of moving. And if that were the equivalent of two years' rent, he would lose by moving, unless the advantage which he secured in rates amounted to two shillings in the pound for thirty years. When, however, a person is changing his abode for any reason, he is likely to allow their full weight to all considerations as to the present and prospective rates in different localities, which may be suitable for his purpose. The mobility of the working class is, in some respects, greater than that of the well-to-do. But when rates are compounded, friction sometimes acts on the side of the tenant and delays the transference to him of his share of new burdens. The manufacturer is often affected as much by the rates on his workmen's dwellings as by those on his own premises. And though high rates may be among the causes which have driven some manufacturers out of large towns, it is doubtful whether, when economically con administered, they have had much net effect in this direction. For most new expenditure from the rates, when under able and upright management, materially increases local comforts or lessens local discomforts from the point of view of the work people, if not of the manufacturer himself. Further, although the balance of evidence goes to show that lazies consider carefully the present and probable immediate future of local rates. Yet, they cannot see far ahead, and they seldom even try to do so. Note 67. Any analysis that is offered of the incidence of rates must be taken to refer to general tendencies rather than actual facts. The causes which prevent these tendencies from being applied in prediction resemble those which prevent mathematical reasonings from being applied to the cost of a ball on the deck of a ship that is rolling and pitching in cross seas. If the ship would but stay at one inclination, the movement of the ball could be calculated but before any one tendency has had time to produce much result, it will have ceased to exist, and its successor cannot be predicted. Just so, though economists settled once for all, nearly a century ago, the general tendencies of the shifting of taxation, yet the relative weight of onerous rates in different places often changes so rapidly that a tendency may make but little headway before it is stopped or even reversed by
by changes which cannot be predicted. Paragraph 2. We have already seen that the ground rent, which a builder is willing to pay for any site, is governed by his estimate of the additional value which that site will give to the buildings erected on it. Before taking the lease, his capital and that which he will borrow for the purpose is free and expressed in terms of money. The anticipated income from his investment is expressed also in money. He sets on the one side his outlay for building, and on the other side the excess of the rental value of the building, with its site over the ground rent to which he is about to commit himself. He works out, perhaps roughly and by instinct, rather than definite arithmetical calculations, the present discounted value of this excess for the, say, 99 years of his lease. Finally, he takes the lease if he sees his way to a good margin of profit, and no better opening for his enterprise is at hand. Note 68. He contrives, to the best of his ability, that the site and the house, or other building, which he puts upon it, shall be permanently appropriate, the one to the other. In so far as he succeeds, the rent of the property at any future time is the sum of its annual site value and the annual value of the building. And this he expects to yield him full profits on his outlay allowing for insurance against the risks of a rather hazardous industry. This second part of the rent is commonly, though perhaps not with strict property, called the annual building value or the building rent of the house. As time goes on, the purchasing power of money may change. The class of house for which that site is suitable is likely to change, and the technique of building is certain to be improved. Consequently, the total annual value of the property at a later date consists of its annual site value, together with profits on the cost of building a house, giving accommodation equally desirable at that date with the existing house. But all this is subject to the dominant condition that the general character of the house has remained appropriate to its site. If it has not, no precise statement as to the relation between total value, site value, and building value can be made. If, for instance, a warehouse or a dwelling house of quite a different character is needed to develop the full resources of the site. The total value of the property as it stands may be less than its site value alone. For the site value cannot be developed without pulling down those buildings and erecting new. And the value of the old material in those buildings may be less than the cost of pulling them down, allowance being made for the obstruction and loss of time incident thereto. Paragraph 3. As between two buildings, equally eligible in other respects, the occupier will pay for that which has the better situation, an annual sum equivalent to its special advantages. But he does not care what part of this sum goes as rent and what as taxes. Therefore, onerous taxes on site values tend to be deducted from the rental, which the owner 
or lessee receives, and they are accordingly deducted, in so far as they can be foreseen, from the ground rent, which a builder or anyone else is willing to pay for a building lease. Such local rates as are remunerative are in the long run paid by the occupier but are no real burden to him. The condition in the long run is essential. For instance, rates levied on account of interest and sinking fund on a town improvement, which will for several years to come disturb the public tour affairs and yield none of its good fruit, will be onerous to the occupier if he pays it. In strict justice, it should be deducted from his rent, because when the improvement is in full working order, and especially when the debt has been paid off, so that the rate in question lapses, the owner of the property will reap the benefits of the onerous tasks of the onerous rates levied on account of it from the first. Note 69. Paragraph 4. Taxes on building values are on a different footing. If uniform all over the country, they do not alter the differential advantages of favored sites, and therefore do not, directly at least, make the builder or anyone else less willing to pay a high ground rent for a good site. If they are so heavy as materially to narrow the area of ground built upon, they will indeed lower the value of all building ground, and special site values will fall with the rest. But their effect in this direction is so small that no great error is made by saying that uniform taxes on building values do not fall on the ground owner. The building, in so far as he anticipates such taxes, adjusts his plans to them. He aims at putting up buildings of only such expense as can be let to tenants at rents that will yield him normal profits while the tenant pays the rates. He may, of course, miscalculate, but in the long run, builders as a class, like all other able businessmen, are nearly right in their calculations. And in the long run, uniform taxes on building values fall upon the occupier or at the last, on his customers, if he uses the building for trade purposes and his competitors are subject to similar rates. But the case is quite different in regard to special high onerous local rates on building values. And here comes in the chief difference between the incidence of national taxes on immovable property and local rates on it. Remunerative expenditure from the rates, which adds more to the conveniences of life than the equivalent of its cost, do not, of course, repel the occupier. That part of them which is assessed on building values is paid by him, but is no real burden on him as we have seen in the case of remunerative rates on site values. But that part of the rates on building values, which is onerous, and in excess of corresponding charges in other localities, does not fall mainly on the occupiers. Any exceptional pressure will cause them to migrate beyond its reach in sufficient numbers to reduce the demand for houses and other buildings in the locality. T. 
till the burden of these exceptional rates falls upon the lessees or owners. Builders, therefore, in so far as they can foresee the future, deduct the equivalent of these exceptional onerous rates on building values, together with all rates and taxes on site values from the ground rents which they are willing to pay. But the cases in which great deductions of this kind are made are not numerous and important. For permanent inequalities of onerous rates, though considerable, are less than is commonly taught, and many of them are due to accidents which cannot easily be foreseen such as mismanagement by a particular group of local administrators. There is indeed one broad and perhaps permanent cause which throws its shadow before, namely the tendency of the world to do to move away from crowded districts to roomy and fashionable suburbs, thus leaving the working classes to bear an undue share of the national duties towards the very poor. But no sooner does this evil become conspicuous than legislation is invoked to remedy it by widening the areas of rating for some purposes so as to include poor and rich districts under the same budget and in other ways. It is of greater importance to remember that exceptional onerous rates on building values, while tending to lower site rents and to lower the ground rents on new leases in the districts to which they apply, are not as great a burden on the whole body of owners of land as seems at first sight. For much of the building enterprise, which is checked by such rates, is not destroyed but directed to other districts and raises the competition for building new leases there. Paragraph 5 The incidence of a long-established rate is little affected by its being collected from the tenants and not from the owners, though it is vitally affected by the proportions in which the rate is assessed on site and building values respectively. On the other hand, the incidence for the first few years of an increase in onerous rates is much affected by the mode of collection. The occupier bears more of the new burden than he would if part of the rates were collected from the owners or he were allowed to deduct a part of them from his rent. This applies only to neighborhoods that are making progress. Where the population is residing and building has ceased, onerous rates tend to press upon owners. But in such places, economic friction is generally strong. It seems probable that the total pressure of onerous rates on the enterprise of building speculators and other interim owners is not very great, and that many rates of which they have complained have really enriched them. But vicissitudes of the rates increase slightly the great risks of the building trade, and inevitably the community pays for such risks more than their actuarial equivalent. All this points to the grievous evils which arise from great and sudden increases in the rates, especially in regard to premises, the rateable value of which is high relatively to the net income of the occupier. The trader, especially if a shopkeeper, is often able to throw some part of the burden of his rates on his customers. At all events, 
if he deals in things which cannot be easily got from a distance. But the shopkeeper's rates are very large relatively to his income, and some of that expenditure from the rates, which is remunerative from the point of view of well-to-do residents, appears onerous to him. His work belongs to that group in which economic progress is raising supply relatively to demand. A little while ago, his remuneration was artificially high at the expense of society, but now it is falling to a lower and perhaps more equitable level, and he is slow to recognize the new conditions. His mind fastens on the real injustice which he suffers when rates are suddenly raised much, and he attributes to that some of the pressure on him which is really due to deeper causes. His sense of injustice is sharpened by the fact that he does not always bargain on quite even terms with his landlord, for to say nothing of the cost of fixtures and the general expense of a change, he might lose a great part of his custom by moving to equally good premises even a little way off. It must, however, be remembered that the shopkeeper does migrate sometimes, that his mind is alert, and he takes full account of the rates, and thus, after a few years, he shifts the burden of onerous rates onto the owners and customers more fully than a man of almost any other class does. Parenthesis open. The hotel and lodging housekeeper may rank here with the shopkeeper. Parenthesis close. <laughs>